Well, hello there! I don't think we've been properly introduced. I'm Bonzi. Bonzi Buddy to me sort of was the first internet friend I had in a weird way. Bonzi Buddy was kind of like your virtual pet slash assistant. Oh, I was so cute! It's purple, this friend, Bonzi this Buddy. sort of little gorilla that like that was just you know, there to help Bonzi you Buddy. and have a nice time on your computer. Every once in a while Bonzi. that ape would come up and... I would describe the experience of using the internet in the early 2000s as you would type in a website address, hit enter, and then take your hands off the keyboard. There would be windows popping up on top of windows. There would be little animations going across the screen. There would be X marks that kept moving to try to close these windows. Before the internet, computers were still basically a hobbyist area, researchers, hackers. You know, those are the kinds of people who were using the internet. Things were becoming more mainstream for computing. A lot of it was driven in the office. People were shifting from paper-based activities to doing things on a computer in a word processor or a spreadsheet. Once the web browser came out in the mid-1990s, that opened up a whole world to regular people just to open a web browser, type in an address, and find information that seemed limitless at the time. Providing software up until that point was a very straightforward business model. You went to a store and you bought a piece of software and it came in a floppy disk or a, um, a CD-ROM, and then you put it into your computer and you own that piece of software. You own a license to that piece of software. The internet allowed software to be delivered you know, over the internet. And so people started experimenting with different business models. There are a billion websites out there. With technology ever cheaper and ever simpler, it's a highly inclusive club. We can all have a website if we want one and business is increasingly sniffing an opportunity. We've seen budgets escalate massively from when a time two and a half, three years ago when someone spending a few tens of thousands was a big deal to now somebody spending a few tens of millions is a big deal. That dot-com boom showed that if you have an idea and you put a dot-com next to it and you make an internet company, you are going to make millions. That was the dream. So you had all kinds of different things popping up Maybe not necessarily as a good business plan or even a long activity, but that was the dream that people were chasing. I think like the biggest one I remember from that era is pets.com where you had the little sock puppet and everybody was just like, what is the entire point? I'm not buying pet food on the internet. Why would a company spend so much money on a Super Bowl ad to talk about a company that had no viability. There were all kinds of businesses that were being created in order to um, you know, make money off the internet, with connecting all of these people together, even though it was still a fairly small phenomenon in society. And advertising was gonna play a major role in that. All these companies were springing up, all these businesses were coming up and no one really understood how that would be useful or why we even needed it, but that's where all the money was. I mean, we were seeing millions on all this. And then in like the early 2000s, all that came crashing down. The worst hit shares around the world have been the technology stocks, including the dot-com companies. A year ago, there were hundreds of internet companies being floated here on the NASDAQ, but not now. The rose-tinted spectacles have come off. The emperor's new clothes have been seen through. The lunatics have been put back in the asylum and the internet bubble, well, it's burst. When the Nasdaq collapsed in April of 2000, that was sort of the end of the dot-com era. A lot of investors pulled their money out of dot-com stocks. The market stopped believing that these companies would eventually make money. And that's when we saw the rise of a direct response advertising business. The internet became a huge 
advertising ecosystem. So a lot of companies basically said, okay, we are going to try to figure out ways to do it. Especially then if you try to visualize the browser, you have the browser, you have the URL bar where you type in the URL, and then everything between where the page starts and where the URL bar, that's prime real estate because you're always looking at it. Some people saw a business model, other people saw security risks. Back then there was a lot of porn that was in the pop of advertisements, but whatever the bad guys get paid to put up, they put it up. And as you know, there were pop-ups and to be able to keep the the income going, they hijack the browser and it could be extremely difficult to get control of your browser back. Between 1990 and 2012, we had an 88 fold or more increase in internet users and there was no education. I mean, it's like if you compare it to automobiles, we had decades to learn what's safe, what's not safe, and we still have tons of accidents. but. You know, people had information how to avoid them. Internet. Originally, like the internet was this like really hard to get to thing. Unless you had AOL and it came in those CDs, or you had CompuServe with a really, really long string of numbers as your username that you couldn't change. Like getting on the internet itself was a bit of a difficulty. Computers weren't very friendly. You had to know what button to click or what menu choice to choose, and, and you had to learn that. Microsoft Bob was kind of designed to change that paradigm and turn it into to a more social experience. and. and and to make the, those hurdles easier to overcome. And so by putting that kind of human feeling to um, you know, what's otherwise a cold machine helped overcome barriers. Microsoft, they developed this agent technology and they did the agent on one side, which was those four characters, PD and Genie and Robbie, I think was one and somebody else. When Microsoft introduced Clippy, the little paper clip on Microsoft Office and where you'd be typing and it suddenly popped up this animated thing and being like, Hi, you look like you're typing a letter. Can I help you with formatting? Virtual assistants uh, were uh, typically little animated characters that would sit in the lower corner of the screen and they'd have dialogue boxes like you'd see in a comic book pop up above them. There was an explosion of these virtual assistants that popped up and the idea was they would be your guide through the internet. And oftentimes they were cute and cuddly. My name is Bonzi. How are you today? Bonzi Buddy was a purple monkey. It was a digital assistant. It lived on your Windows computer. So Clippy was attached to Microsoft Office. If you opened up Office and you were using it, Clippy would pop up. Bonzi Buddy was not. It was just on its own. You downloaded it, you installed it directly on the OS. I know he would do like little dad jokes. Like you tell him to tell you a joke and they were really cheesy. Like it wasn't anything memorable. It wasn't actually really funny. You were just like, that's zinger, I guess. <laughs> Um, and then sometimes he would like, if you leave him in the corner, he'd just start like reading, like pull out a book. He would like start juggling some coconuts from time to time. Like he would just randomly like swing across the computer. The most vivid memory I have of something that I used from, from the Bonzi Buddy, uh, like one of the features that it had was the sing a song feature. And I remember when I used to click sing a song, it used to sing this, this song, which I now understand is, is called, it's called Daisy Bell. Okay, here goes. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer truth. When I downloaded it, I would have been about 10. Anything singing anything at me on my computer um, at my behest was like mind blowing. It was using this kind of friendly paradigm of first it was a parrot and later it was a purple gorilla that would sit in the corner of your screen and and seemed friendly. And, you know, that that's the face of it. But underneath that, it was collecting information, it was collecting contacts, it was sending information, it was displaying advertising, it was getting in the way of things that you were doing. So it would jump over your programs and, and cover them up in a pop-up format. And so it had some very negative behaviors. The model that they had was to use this to display ads for their other products. So they would get people to, to buy their other products. When I was using Bonzi, it installed a bunch of stuff into the into the computer. I remember when I was 
using the browser there were some extensions there were some toolbars and all of that stuff that back in the day when you used to use a computer in 2000s you had just toolbars by the company and stuff like that and i remember doing searches and stuff it always had a presence it would pop up a lot of fake what's called dialog boxes which would say something is wrong with your computer and they would look like they came from microsoft i didn't even think that i knew it was bonzi buddy that was connected to like the pop-up stuff like i'd have let's say neopets that have it running in the background and then like every 30 40 minutes or so something would pop up saying like you need to update this or you need to download this and i remember i didn't want to get in trouble so i would just like click x immediately and you'd be really careful too so you don't accidentally click on anything inside of the window because from what I remember, if you click even in the window, like something else would pop up. So you'd have to be just like really careful to click the X. We did get pop-ups and like weird things flashing on the screen. And then we all kind of started talking about viruses on our computers, something I didn't really know much about as a 10 year old at the time. I remember the computer slowing down and stuff like that a few times just because of that, probably because it was always active and it was sort of always tracking you or, or doing all of these things that were sort of, uh, you know, creating that load on your computer. It would just go black and then the green lines would happen and you're like, I don't, I'd just be like, I'll just turn it off and then I'll, I'll wait for my dad to come back and try to work. And when he turns it on, it's broken. I'm like, I didn't do it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> From a corporate and enterprise perspective, it became an IT nightmare because one of the things Bondi Buddy would do is it would take over your browser homepage, it would redirect you to sites, it would show you ads, and it would just get into the point where it was affecting usability. Yeah, that's when I think my mom started looking at the computer and being like, what have you done? <laughs> and what have you downloaded? And I think that's when we tried to uninstall it I don't remember that being an easy process. It was far easier to install software than it was to uninstall it. It was far easier to get something on your computer than it was to get rid of it. And with uh, Bonzi Buddy and a lot of other toolbars, their goal was to stay on your computer as long as possible. It wasn't virus. It wasn't a malware in the traditional sense of, oh my goodness, this is like something that's going to make our computer stop working. It worked fine. It was just really annoying having it around. So it was the perfect lesson for people saying, just because it's free doesn't mean you should download it. There's a saying that if it's free, then you're the product. And sometimes you're the product, but you're being sold to not so desirable people. Bonzi's antics didn't go unnoticed for long. In 2002, Bonzi Software, the company behind the friendly desktop gorilla, got hit with a class action lawsuit over its use of deceptive ads. The company also violated the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, by consistently collecting children's data without parental consent. Bonzi, I think, crossed the line. They got taken to court over the fact that they were collecting information, which is a safe bet because how else is something like that going to make money they weren't they weren't popping up ads so they had to make money somehow probably by gathering info and selling it it's a very lucrative business and they got in trouble for doing that without asking and then they got in trouble for doing that to children under 13 which violated uh, the children's privacy protection act as kids we relied on saturday morning cartoons for our commercial so they were very strict about what kind of stuff you could have on a commercial back then. We came to the internet, there wasn't a lot of regulation about what kind of ads or what kind of things that you allowed to look at. And once the advertisers realized that, they got really um, out of control. And then the regulators came in and said, you know what, you still can't market to kids. Bonzi Software eventually paid $75,000 to the Federal Trade Commission for its violation of COPPA. By 2004, Bonzi Software settled both lawsuits and agreed to put an end to deceptive marketing gimmicks. It soon went out of business, but one thing had become clear. Bonzi was much more than a harmless looking ape. So how exactly did it infiltrate our computers and deceive us?
the funny thing is, it wasn't as if this software was created using like any weird tool. It was actually using the same engine that Microsoft had used to create Clippy and all the others. Like it was actually a Microsoft agent that was entirely designed to be this avatar-like thing that people can talk to and it would give you information back. And it was a whole thing that Microsoft thought would be useful to make computers less intimidating. It's important to remember at the time in the early 2000s how dominant Microsoft was. How many of you use a PC without Microsoft's operating system? But Microsoft's software came with flaws. If you were a bad actor and you wanted to make a piece of software um, to benefit yourself, you would do it for Microsoft because that's what everyone had. So the Microsoft agent was distributed uh, in the Bonzi days uh, using something called the Microsoft Developer Network. It was just this giant kit of CDs that you would get in the mail and it would have everything in there that they were working on. Microsoft Exchange Server, Microsoft Server, Office, Microsoft Agent was one of those. So that's probably how Bonzi got it. And it was meant for guys like them. We are all very private individuals, but the internet is a very public device and, and much of the traffic is open to, to great inspection by all sorts. Privacy is one of the, the great concerns that people have, and it's very important that in this medium, consumers be informed of what's going on with their information and, and that they have the option to control exactly what's done. Uh, we're taking a leading role in terms of how websites actually declare what they're doing with that information. At the time Bonzi Buddy came out, the, the term potentially unwanted program didn't even exist. The antivirus companies really didn't know what to do with this because it clearly, it wasn't clearly malicious. You know, it's not like it was stealing keystrokes. It's not like it was locking your computer so that you couldn't access it or spreading itself like a worm. It, it, so it didn't have some of these traditional characteristics of viruses and worms. But it did have behaviors that were incredibly intrusive and not particularly well Welcome by, by many people. I got a little baby let you out of sight. I talked her across the telephone. Another pretty significant issue with software around that time was the end user license agreement. The EULA is where a company would disclose what they were doing with the software. And you can have a legitimate software company that, that puts together a EULA that discloses their behaviors in a, a pretty concrete way so that you can actually read and get an understanding of what the software will do. Hardly anybody read them because they were all legalese and long and sometimes hard to get to or in a tiny little window and you'd have to scroll forever in order to read it. But it was also a window for those who were in that gray space to give themselves a bit of legal cover. You know, if they disclose something in the EULA, you can't come back, the perception was, you can't come back and say, well, your practices are deceptive. You didn't say you were going to do this. In the case of, of Bonzi, one of the first things it says in the EULA is that Bonzi software reserves all rights not expressly granted to you in the EULA. So their EULA is basically saying, we can do anything we want on your computer and you're agreeing to that. One of the things that took place around that time is uh, the creation of the Anti-Spyware Coalition. The Center for Democracy and Technology uh, set this up and invited uh, all of the major antivirus companies to come and participate in this forum designed to come together and create common taxonomy for what is spyware, what is uh, adware, what are the behaviors which are negative and should result in removal, or at what point do you need to give customers a prompt to say this software is on your computer and you need to make a choice about whether to keep it. If that's shaped anything, I think it's made people a lot more careful when they're building software. I mean, you know, involving legal uh, in your software development process is now a standard thing. The code has to be looked at to see if anything's been stolen from somewhere else. The mission of the software has to be looked at. How it does this mission has to be looked at. It's all looked by a new kind of lawyer, a technology lawyer, uh, and they will tell you whether you're you know, in compliance with whatever you have to be in compliance with or not. And I think stuff like Bonzi helped shape that. I think the experience of adware um, has a lot of lessons for today and how the internet is still dealing with a lot of flaws of the way it was set up when it became commercialized. 
I don't think at this point we can say computers are secure. I think there have been a lot of advances in security. I think the Microsoft Trustworthy Computing Initiative, where they stopped development and made their developers learn about security and went back and reviewed code and so on, I think that was a real changing point uh, for the industry as a whole. I think the introduction of things like Windows Update, where it made it easy for security updates to, to be brought down to the computer, are terrific advances that, that did help increase the security assurance broadly across the internet. However, adversaries have gotten better as well. And the monetization of criminal activity on the internet creates a, a very perverse incentive to uh, take advantage of even the smallest loopholes. I don't think we do a very good job of learning from the internet. We should be careful about, you know, getting information, getting things. But then social media came along and we're handing over all our information, letting it follow us, all of us on our phone. We're downloading software apps left and right. I wish we were learning our lessons better. I think we're just learning them on each platform all over again. I am about to listen to Bonzi Buddy singing Daisy for what's probably the first time in 20 years. Okay, here goes. Daisy, Daisy. Give me your answer true. It's I'm not even spelled right. <laughs> crazy, all for the love of you. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't afford a carriage. Oh, this is opening such weird sweet. memories for me. Upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. So it's worse than I remember. And I think I've suppressed that. 